June 22nd is when parts of the city of Elmira began to flood at like eight o'clock at night is when they started the evacuation process on the south side. And then at like 3 a.m. on the 23rd, they started evacuating all of the little lying areas in the city. My father woke us up. Uh, we went out on the front doorstep and uh, we were right at the bottom really of Partridge Street where Conley came in and, and uh, looking down Conley we could see the floodwaters coming over the wall and uh, we didn't bother moving anything in the house. We really just got in the vehicle and uh, went where we were directed to go. A little traumatic in that, you know, seeing the water come over the flood walls on that night and uh, you know, knowing that we were being evacuated, uh, we were taken over to the uh, Southside High School gym initially. Uh, then we were transferred over to uh, Broadway Elementary where we stayed at least a month in a classroom with other families. After the elementary school, we, we did live in the trailer park. Uh, it wasn't really a trailer park, it was a, somebody's, you know, a kid's park that they made into a trailer park. And we did live there for probably, you know, it could have been, you know, 12, 14 months. Uh, I'm not sure how long that was, you know. But I'd say that people, you know, negatively affected greatly by the loss of their items, personal items that are not replaceable. That is probably the worst of it, um, combined with trying to repair your house. Um, you know, you, had, you have to have a temporary place to live uh, until you could fix that house. Um, shoveling a lot of mud, spraying off a lot of clothes, uh, old photographs that we could try and save. Pumping out water. I was putting everything that uh, you know, like extra stuff. There were some pots and pans. The most important thing, though, was my wedding album. All my pictures, my wedding album. We found out several days later that uh, the cellar was flooded up to the, oh, gee, second, third step of the house, and all the boxes were kind of floating in dirty, muddy water. Gone. Any wedding pictures I had, yeah, gone. I was living uh, over here on uh, 6th Street, I took my driver's test on the day before the river went over the dike. And at that time, I didn't have a driver's license. I rode my bike everywhere. I went to my next door neighbor and I said, my husband put the car in the shop. Can I, uh, can I borrow your car to take my driver's test? So I took my test, went across the river, across um, uh, Walnut Street Bridge. It was um, kind of a, 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 I don't know, it was a steel bridge, a gridiron sort of thing. Right. But you could look right through, down through the, uh, the grid there and see the river. When we went over the river, the water was sloshing up through the grid. And you talk about scary. For somebody who doesn't have their driver's license, it was like, but every day I would say, Bob, the river's going over the dike, and he says, the Army Corps of Engineers came into Elmira in 1948 and they built that dike up to flood level. There's no way that river is going over the dike. And every day I'd go down and watch with everybody, uh, down and stand on the dike, down at the end of uh, Walnut Street here. And every day I'd come back on my bike, no way that river is going over that dike. I watched the Walnut Street Bridge go, and I was telling everybody there, I said, I just went over that, <laughs> that bridge a couple of hours ago, but I saw uh, a house was what took it out. I, I, it was yellow or white, I can't remember, but you know, we're all standing there going, oh my God, there's a house, and it got jammed under the, uh, under the bridge. What, what I did was I volunteered uh, Elmira College. Uh, uh, they took in a lot of people, mainly it was Southside people. They took a lot of people in 
uh, from the south side and I said, you know, I was a nurse and uh, that any young mothers with small children uh, could come to my house and uh, I made a formula. At that time, you didn't have the prepared formula. You had to make it and sterilize the bottles and mix it up and, you know, right. it was a process. Back at that time when newborns were released from the hospital, um, they were released in a cardboard box, like so by so, and had a little plastic um, mattress in the bottom. We couldn't even really call it a pad, it wasn't really a mattress in the bottom. And of course, you, um, your baby was dressed and then blankets and you know whatever to make the baby comfortable but that was how babies were released from the hospital we didn't even have seat belt regulations we thought well okay let's pack up I got a as big a black plastic garbage bag as I could find and I put everything of the babies in that garbage bag you know all the clothing all of all the things that you have as accessories when you have a new baby. Right. Everything went into that black plastic bag. We didn't worry about taking much of anything else. Um, loaded it into the car, myself and my husband and um, the baby. I had made arrangements for um, childcare for the new baby, but um, the person who was going to take him. Um, house, her house was flooded as well. Her house was um, on a little side street just across from Parley Coburn School in the south side. And their house was flooded, so I had no daycare um, arrangement for my baby, and I couldn't go back to work until I had um, someone to care for him. So well, a very, very close friend of mine um, took him and cared for him um, until we were able to, you know, resume the arrangements that we had orig originally planned. And she wouldn't charge me anything for it, so I had free day of care for that whole summer. Right. And um, she just took beautiful care of him. I was so lucky that I had that opportunity to have that. We were working one night, my buddies and I were walking in a line, three of us, my buddies in the middle, got a shovel over his shoulders walking like this, and we're walking in about a foot of water in the middle of the street. He's walking, all of a sudden he disappears. He stepped into an open manhole. Went down the manhole, that shovel was there, probably saved his life. You know, we were able to, to pull him out. Um, the day after the flood, we were helping um, police and firefighters rescue folks uh, in a boat that were, had stayed in their houses. Um, I remember an uh, elderly woman, she was in the second story. The boat was crowded. We were trying to get her to come off and get in the boat, but she wouldn't get in the boat until we took her dog and her cat and her parakeet. And they kept saying, we don't have room, we don't have room. And this woman would not get in. Finally, we got the, the, the animals in and got the woman in the boat. And then we would take her, I think then we were taking her to Broadway uh, Elementary School. That was one of the, um, the shelters. Um, also going, in, going into homes, um, the first floor would be destroyed. And what was interesting about the flood, as soon as it got above your floor, and then you're, you're, you're downstairs with room because most people had hardwood floor. It didn't matter then if it was up two, three, four feet, five feet. Um, and so uh, uh, everybody's hardwood floors were torn up. Anybody who went through the flood will talk about the mud that there was and that smell from the mud. Still to this day, I'll often go into places, cellars, open up an old cabinet and I'll get that smell and it brings back those, those memories. When something like a major natural disaster happens, I think it's impossible to exaggerate um, the impact of it. 
Um, and it produces scars that linger for a long time. Um, Elmira just didn't recover from the flood. Um, many, Water Street was practically abandoned. Um, most of the businesses that had been on Water Street just disappeared. There were many vacant um, storefronts. It never came back, never. What I'd like people to know is with the levee system, you know, it's just not a mound of, mound of soil. I mean, it's a constructed, engineered structure. And it, it really requires, you know, great attention to the sod. Something I get often is, it's, it's not gonna flood again. They built, after 72, they built a couple uh, dams. Uh, operated by the Corps of Engineers on the Tioga River, Castillo River. You know, that's really upstream of the Shemung River. Um, you know, those are there to hold the water back somewhat and release a little more slowly. The water will still rise in Elmira, Corning Elmira. Um, it's still gonna rise up. And what people don't understand is that water, I mean, they can only hold so much water in these dams. They're going to be releasing. Um, the water is going to stay on the levee longer, which causes uh, saturation of the levee. Instead of the water rising up and then coming down, you know, getting through Elmira, it's going to come up and it's going to stay up. It's going to stay up for a longer period of time than in 72. And that's going to create saturation of the levees, which uh, really the protection of the levees, really the, the sod that holds everything together from the you know, erosion and failure of these levees. It's important to understand that any, any kind of flood protection system that you construct can always be you know, overrun, really, by Mother Nature. So there, you know, it's a great possibility of you know, flooding over that levee system at some point. You may live right next to the levee and think, I'm glad that thing's there, but it's come over that levee before, it'll probably come over again. <laughs>